haven't had to do this with my mask on. Doug, I'm going to just step over here. Um, this is impressive. I'm, I'm thrilled with the crowd that we've got. Um, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to just walk around and take some pictures so that I've got uh, a record of who's here. Um, and those uh, restoration and biodiversity students can get credit for being in person. And then we're going to get some snaps of who's zoomed in. Um, so today I am incredibly excited to introduce Doug Emlin um, as our featured speaker. Uh, we always try to open our speaker series in September with a big splash and this certainly goes in accord with um, our trend. Dr. Emlin uh, ranks with Sean Carroll, Neil Shubin, and has published uh, even with Carl Zimmer um, on evolutionary uh, topics, not the least of which is animal weapons. Uh, having watched a number of talks by Dr. Emlin, I've learned that he's loved animals his entire life, and so this has been a long-term calling. He studies primarily beetles. Uh, he uses beetles as his, as his primary study subjects and um, has gone on to examine the weapons of animals across the board using uh, arthropods as a launch pad. He has an impressive history, but I am going to let his talk speak for itself. Um, and please, at the end, uh, even though he's on Zoom, we'd love to get some conversation going and uh, engage questions. So make sure that you keep notes along the way and don't hesitate to speak up if you have any questions. Doug, welcome. I'm going to mute myself and I'll keep an eye on things. You're All right. Here. Can you hear me? Thank yes, you. So thanks everybody. So as you just heard, I'm an evolutionary biologist and I study the development and evolution of animal weapons. And again, as you just heard specifically in my case, this means the horns of beetles. So over the years, my students and colleagues and I have used all kinds of different approaches to try to study these crazy weapons. So for example, we've used biomechanics and engineering approaches to look at how these horns function as tools that either lift or pry or twist. And we've used genomic and developmental genetic approaches to study how these horns grow. So literally digging into the genes and the developmental pathways that build a horn and control how large that horn grows to be. And we use population genetics to reconstruct how these weapons have evolved. So specifically how they've changed in size from population to population and from species to species. We even spend long nights out in the rain watching these beetles to see how they fight, to measure the strength of selection acting on these horns in the wild. And our latest twist, by the way, I don't know if you can hear that, is the sound coming through? It may not be, but that's a film of a courtship sequence of beetles. Our latest twist is that we've discovered that the females in these rhinoceros beetles are much, much choosier than anyone expected. And even after battling to hold on to a territory using the horns, a male beetle then has to turn around and sing to try to attract females. And they do all these sort of courtship songs and dances. So right now we have soundproof boxes set up in the lab and we're trying to record these courtship sequences among these males to start to get a handle on the female perspective and figure out what they're choosing and why. But I'm actually not gonna to talk to you about any of this today. I mentioned it sort of fast and upfront, mostly so you'll know where I'm coming from. But instead, what I wanna do is I wanna share a wild set of ideas with you that I think are even more exciting and they're certainly more relevant and important. So a few years ago, I had a chance to step back from the Beatles and to pour through the literature on all sorts of animal extremes crab claws, walrus tusks, fly antlers, elk antlers, the works. The weapons in all of these species are so outlandish in proportion that these animals look like they shouldn't be possible. I mean, the animals that wield these things, if you step back and look at them, they look like they should tip over or trip or collapse under the bulk and the weight of these weapons. So I compiled everything I could on all of these crazy and wonderful weapon extremes to ask questions like, how did their weapons get to be so big? And is there such a thing as too big? Well, I also scoured the literature on another type of weapon extreme, and this is our own. So for as you all know, we humans make weapons too. 
Now, manufactured weapons aren't parts of our bodies, like tusks or horns, and instructions for their construction aren't encoded in DNA. But their forms change over time in much the same way that animal weapons do. And it turns out that the directions of this evolution are molded by really similar forces of selection. So successful models are copied and spread, while less successful models gradually disappear. So that populations, if you will, of manufactured weapons transform through time. And when the conditions are just right, these weapons can get taken to extremes too, surging forward to bigger and bigger sizes, deadlier, faster, and vastly more expensive. So I laid side by side the literatures on animal and military weapons to look at how and why weapons get big. And wow, am I glad that I did this because the parallels that I stumbled on literally rocked my world. They utterly transformed the way that I look at extreme weapons, changing in many ways how I looked at my own system, the Beatles, and even to a startling degree, changing the way that I looked at the political realities of the world around us. Things like terrorism and weapons of mass destruction and national security. Extreme weapons, I'm gonna to suggest to you today, are extreme weapons. Animal, human, it does not matter because their stories are exactly the same. So with the time that I have today, what I wanna do is I wanna show you what I mean by this by highlighting three of the parallels between animal and human weapons. And the first of these parallels begins with a problem. I mean, arguably it is a big problem, the sort of these overarching question in all of the animal systems at least. And that is why do only some species have these huge weapons? I mean, the quick answer is simply that, well, weapons in these particular species got caught up in an arms race, swept into a cycle where bigger was better, a lot better, so that weapon sizes ratcheted up fast, culminating in these species where animals wield these extraordinary structures. But honestly, all that does is reframe the question then. Why did arms races get triggered in these particular species and not in so many others? And this may look like a lot of species, but I promise it's not. Considered against the backdrop of the diversity of life, this is a pittance, it's a drop in the bucket. Technically, it's less than one-tenth of one percent of the described animal taxa. So I guess what we're getting at here is what's so special about these particular species? And how can we explain why they have such big weapons when so many other species, even closely related biologically similar species, do not? So is there a generalizable set of conditions that precipitate arms races in animals and can an appreciation of those conditions help us then explain this sort of big picture pattern of morphological diversity? Well, it was clear right away that two of the central tenets of my field of, of biology, animal behavior, held sway here. And together, these two things helped explain a lot of this diversity. So first, there was no question that the biggest animal weapons were all the product of what we call sexual selection. I'm just going to add a fun quick aside here. There is also one other ecological context that also sometimes leads to the evolution of huge weapons. It's a specialized style of hunting called ambush predation. And I can talk a little bit more about this after the talk if you like. But there are set examples of hunters where they don't have to, whoa, sorry, they don't have to chase down prey fast. Instead, they sit and wait and they reach out or they clasp out quickly to ambush prey. And in this very specialized ecological context, you can also sometimes get the evolution of really big weapons. But setting this one context aside, most of the time, in most taxa, extreme weapons evolve in the context of sexual selection. So intense competition among males for access to females. Turns out it's a driver of weapon evolution in the overwhelming majority of these heavily armed species. And I can explain the logic of sexual selection, including why it is almost always males battling with rival males and not the other way around after the talk, if you like. But suffice this to say at this point that the backdrop for all of these weapons was males battling with rival males over access to females. So 
intense competition was, in a sense, the first critical ingredient, if you want to call it that, of these animal arms races. The second key ingredient, also a fundamental tenet of animal behavior, concerns the economic defensibility of critical or limiting resources. And you're all already almost certainly familiar with the military equivalent of this. Some locations, by virtue of their restricted access, are more readily defended than others. And surrounding things with high walls that open to the outside only through sturdy gatehouses, so narrow restricted tunnels, if you will, that serve as choke points, this can make these things much more cost effective to defend. So they act as force multipliers. And I'm sure you're just as familiar with the cybersecurity equivalent of this, where firewalls, as they're called, restrict access to a small number of heavily protected gateways and tunnels. And I love this artist's rendition of a VPN tunnel. Well, exactly the same logic applies to animals too, and all else being equal, resources that are clumped or otherwise restricted access. So resources that have smaller attack surfaces are more likely to be cost effective for these animals to defend than our resources that are more uniformly distributed or scattered across the landscape. So this is the essence of resource defense mating systems in animals. And together with intense competition, these two ecological principles go a long way towards explaining why some animal species have these huge weapons and why so many other animal species don't. And I love these ideas. There's nothing wrong with them. They're in all the textbooks I've been teaching these ideas in my classes for 20 years. The problem is they're not enough. When you really dig into the details and you look closely, it's very clear that there's a piece missing. There has to be a piece missing because it turns out there are lots of animal species that have intense competition and localized or defensible resources, but they don't have big weapons. And I used to see this all the time. I started out my career working on dung beetles and I spent a lot of time in the tropics and I tracked these brutals all over the world. And I could be anywhere. I could be in a Panamanian rainforest looking at beetles that come to howler monkey dung. I could be in a pasture in North Carolina or Brisbane or Yukai, Australia, or looking at elephant dung. Honestly, it didn't matter what habitat I was in or what continent I was on. In all of these places, I would find literally side by side species with and species without big weapons. I mean, ecologically, these are extremely similar species. They live in the same habitats. They're active in the same seasons. They literally converge on the same piles of dung but only about half of these species have invested in these huge weapons. Well, when you look closely, all of these species face intense male battles with rival males for access to females, so criterion one, and they all guard localized or economically defensible resources, that criterion two. Those resources are either females that are located inside tunnels for some of the species, or females that are clinging to these balls of dung in the rest of these species. But it turns out that only the dung beetle species that fight inside tunnels ever have horns. Now I used to explain this by pointing out, well, tunnels, they restrict access to key resources. So they make those resources cost effective to defend. Boom, it's exactly what theory predicts. But honestly, if you're gonna be fair, Little balls of dung with females clinging to them are pretty localized and defensible too. So what else is different? That question actually haunted me for years, more than 15 years it took me to answer that question, since the pattern was so striking. And yet the overall ecologies and the life histories and the behaviors of these beetles were so similar. Eventually I gave up and I started looking at the details of the fights themselves and I started looking across more and more types of animal species and at more and more weapon systems to see if I could find any bigger patterns that would help me look at this question from a fresh perspective. And when you step back and you look at animal contests, clearly some fights are won by traits other than really big weapons. So swirling acrobatic midair battles of birds and butterflies and wasps, for example, in these cases, stamina and agility are likely to matter most, and clunky, costly weapons would actually only slow these animals down. 
But it turns out when you start looking across the taxa like this, there was one more key ingredient. It was something that I never thought of and something that as far as I can tell, nobody in animal behavior or even biology had ever thought of. And that is duels. It turns out that the fights must play out as one-on-one -on -one duels rather than multiplayer scrambles. And the epiphany for me came from the military literature. And as I've already alluded, there's a rich and vast literature out there on technological innovation and the evolution of manufactured weapons. And some very smart historians have thought a great deal about when and why arms races occur. And they've done all of this without any biology at all. So no evolutionary biology, no animal behavior, nothing. So these scholars bring a completely fresh perspective to these topics. And in this case, the missing piece to this puzzle that I was trying to solve came from the writings of a rather eclectic aeronautical and automotive engineer who around the time of the First World War set out to model battles of attrition. And I don't wanna spend time going into the details of his models, but the essence of his logic was this. If opponents can concentrate their fire, so if they can all attack at once, then given a choice between spending resources on bigger and bigger and better weapons or additional training of existing troops on the one hand, or spending those resources to simply add more troops on the other hand, the answer was it always pays to add more soldiers. Do not invest in expensive weapons and instead just get more soldiers. Lanchester's laws, as they're called, are actually thought to have launched the soon thriving industry of operations research. And one of the lasting legacies of his work is this maxim of never divide your forces on the field of battle. Again, it comes down to this idea that the, the side with the most numbers of soldiers is the one that wins. But it turns out it was the other half of Lanchester's logic and his models that got me all excited. Because if you take his logic and you turn it around, his models suggested that when soldiers do not concentrate their fire, so when they actually line up toe to toe and they confront each other one on one, then it often does pay to invest in bigger and better weapons. Because when the fights play out as duels, the better fighter wins. It turns out it's no accident that for 5,000 years of recorded human history, in just about every culture, the only type of fight that has ever mattered for honor or status was the duel, ritualized, repeatable, and fair. When rivals face each other in battle one-on-one -on -one in contests of strength, the better fighter wins. And this often means the contestant with the biggest and the best and the most expensive weapons. So duels, military history suggested, could create situations where bigger weapons performed better than smaller weapons. So duels could precipitate an arms race. Well, what about in animals? Well, this is the fun part because I now think that duels matter in animal battles too. So fights that play out as duels tend to be highly predictable. They often escalate into protracted, even ritualized contests of strength, where the bigger or the stronger male, the male with the biggest weapons, is likely to win. If you contrast this with the alternative with scrambles, where lots of rival males all tumble simultaneously into the fray, the outcome of multi-attacker scrambles are often far less predictable, and sometimes they're wildly stochastic. In scrambles, the better fighter might not win, and costly big weapons are less likely to be worth the price. So I now suspect that duels is the final piece to the puzzle, the sort of third critical or crucial ingredient for precipitating an arms race. And for the next few minutes, what I wanna do is just take this idea for a spin. Because it turns out that there's some very predictable ecological situations, sort of backdrops for the battles, if you will, that by their nature, cause animal contests to play out as duels. And these situations, I now suspect, act like cauldrons, facilitating the rapid evolution of these extreme or these huge weapons. And the first of these ecological situations is tunnels. I mean, sure, tunnels 
restrict access to a resource. So they do make it economically defensible. But tunnels also align male contests so that they necessarily confront each other face to face and one on one. 10 rival males couldn't possibly all attack at once because only one of them can fit into the tunnel at a time. And I've already told you that for dung beetles, the single biggest difference between the species with and the species without the weapons, the horns, is tunnels. Ball rolling species, which I'll note, fight above ground, in the open, in mad scrambles that often include multiple attackers in the single prey. Ball rolling, ball rolling. Species, hello? Ball rolling dung beetle species never ever have big horns. But the species that fight inside tunnels very often do. Well, in fact, lots of species with big weapons fight over tunnels. So shrimp and crabs that fight over burrows very often have huge claws or really large male weapons. Fiddler crabs are a really good example. Wasps with long tusks, big-headed, big-mandible bees, tusk wettas, which are essentially giant New Zealand crickets, even fanged frogs. All of these species fight inside burrows or tunnels. There is even a giant horned rodent now extinct in Montana that appears to have fought over burrows. So what I'm saying is that in species after species after species, the constrained space of a tunnel aligned male contests so that they necessarily occurred as duels. And that final ingredient appears to have triggered an arms race in these species. Well, branches work the same way. I mean, in a sense, a branch is just an inside out tunnel, since a branch, like a tunnel, is a linear substrate that can be blocked and along which a rival must pass. So I always picture Indiana Jones or Gandalf guarding a bridge. It's exactly the same idea. Branches also align fights so that rivals have to face each other one on one in duels. So many species of rhinoceros beetles fight over branches as do the leaf-footed bugs, which have these awesome exaggerated hind leg weapons. Even horned chameleons fight over branches, and all of these species have really big weapons. Stock-eyed flies illustrate this particularly well. These amazing flies live in the old world tropics, and they roost at night on these dangling little rootlets or hairs that hang down from tree trunks that stick out over stream beds. Males fight with each other to guard these sort of hanging threads, these string-like territories, and bigger males with wider eye stalks are able to hold on to the biggest of these threads. Females then come in and collect on these threads at night, and males then are fighting over possession of these sort of hanging harems, if you will, these threads that have all these females lined up. And here too, just as in tunnels, the linear nature of that root, the, the, the linear nature of that thread that they're collecting on, aligns the male contests so that they necessarily unfold as these face-to-face, one-on-one duels. So battles unfold face-to-face, one-on-one, and these fights, it turns out, are extremely predictable, and selection favors the males with the biggest eye stalks, leading in some cases to the evolution of these amazing, I mean, arguably ridiculous extremes. And the best part about the stock eye fly example is that where there are species that break these rules, so there are, for example, five species within the group of the stock eye flies that no longer roost at night on these hanging threads. Instead, they roost all dispersed and spread out in the leaf litter. As soon as one of these prerequisites falls apart, the benefits of big weapons collapse, and all of these species have lost their extreme eye stalks. And there are many species that fight over resources that are very, very localized, so small that a male can literally plant himself on top of it, stand over this resource to guard it. And I like to think of this like an ice fisherman that's fighting to hold on to the hole that he's drilled in the ice. These species don't have tunnels or branches that force an alignment of the contest, but because the male can sort of stand over that resource and swivel to face any approaching rival male, these fights also, it turns out, end up in many cases playing out as duels, one-on-one -on -one contests with rivals challenging each other face to face. And many of these species also have these huge weapons. 
So the species of rhinoceros beetle that we study, which is you're looking at a video right now, does exactly this. Females collect on wounds on the sides of these trees where the sap oozes out to feed, and males stand over those oozes or those sap flows to guard them. That video was made by one of my graduate students, by the way. The antlered flies also do this. So they stand guard over tiny holes drilled into the bark of a fallen log. Females need these holes in order to lay their eggs. And males that are able to hold their ground, to stand on top of that hole or that wound on the side of the tree, are able to um, secure access and mate with the females as they come through to lay their eggs. Stag beetles fight to guard wounds, just like the rhino beetles, sap oozes on the sides of trees. And males with the biggest weapons are most likely to win these fights too. And they then mate with the females as they come through to feed. Now in the stag beetles too, just like we saw in the stock-eyed flies, as soon as one of these prerequisites or these preconditions breaks down, so there's a couple species of stag beetles where females stop coming to these oozes on the trees to feed and instead they're dispersed in the literature, in the, in the leaf litter. As soon as that one critical ingredient disappears, that lineage of stag beetles lost their extreme weapons and the male mandibles are back down to a normal size. And one of the most extraordinary, in my opinion, of all animals, the harlequin beetles, with literally a 16 inch reach from the end of one foreleg to the end of the other, these massive forelegs, the harlequin beetles use their gangly legs as weapons to grapple with each other face to face over wounds on the sides of fallen fig trees. And here again, males face each other face to face, one on one in a successive pair of duels. And finally, there are lots of animal species that fight totally out in the open. They're not tethered necessarily to a tunnel or a branch or a localized resource. They're just out in the open, but you know, when you look closely, they still end up confronting each other in duels. And here, I think, it's actually the nature of the fight itself that results in the duel. Any of you that have watched the rut unfold in Western Montana, surely you've seen pieces of this process in action. Males in these species use their weapons as signals, as deterrents, something I'll come back to in a minute, sizing each other up. And they only escalate their contests in stages. So these fights ratchet up the danger in steps escalating all the way only when males are very evenly matched. Well, fights like this, they don't happen by accident or by surprise. These types of fights escalate very slowly and very predictably. And by the time these battles get dangerous, they're always one-on-one. -on -one. So even out in the open, their fights still fulfill that last crucial prerequisite of unfolding in duels rather than scrambles. So what I'm proposing here is that we now have a generalizable explanation for when, where, and why particular species evolve these extreme weapons. When species meet these three conditions, selection very often favors the males with the biggest weapons, pushing their evolution to the extreme. So the missing ingredient for explaining these animal arms races, at least, was this idea of duels. Simple changes in behavior. So fighting inside tunnels, for example, or on branches instead of out in the open. Simple changes in behavior like that caused males to begin to confront each other one-on-one -on -one in contests of strength rather than in chaotic scrambles. And that simple change in behavior precipitated an arms race, triggering the explosive evolution of bigger and bigger and bigger weapons. Well, it turns out that we see exactly the same thing when we look at our own military past. I mean, this shouldn't surprise you. After all, that's where the idea came from. But in these cases, it is usually a change in technology that alters the way that opponents or vehicles interact. So a change in technology changes the way these opponents interact, causing them to confront each other in duels rather than scrambles. And in case after case, this simple change in behavior from a scramble to a duel tipped to the balance of selection, sparking an arms race. And I want to show you what I mean with some of my favorite examples. So for almost a thousand years, oared galleys shuttled troops back and forth place to place in the Mediterranean. And over more than a thousand years, there was essentially no change at all 
in the design or the size of these ships. So no evolution, if you will, of these ships at all. Then someone invented the battering ram. So a cast bronze protrusion jutting from the front of the boat. And that simple change in technology changed everything because the boats stopped being vessels of transport and now they started being units, weapons in and of themselves. Ships could strike into other ships and sink them if they were fast enough. So ships started lining up against rival ships in one-on-one -on -one engagements, duels. And that simple switch in behavior precipitated a phenomenal arms race because the faster ship had the advantage. And faster in that age meant more rowers. So the ship started to get longer and longer and longer. They added rowers until the hull started to buckle in rough seas. So then the shipbuilders started stacking rowers on top of each other and one row of oars became two and two rows of oars became three. Soon shipbuilders were adding two or three men to each of the different oars. So threes became fours and then fives and soon there were eights and then nines and then elevens and thirteens. Ships got bigger and bigger and bigger until this arms race climaxed with a monstrosity called Ptolemy's 40. After a thousand years of stasis, one simple change in technology aligned ship interactions so that what had been scrambles now became duels. And from that point forward, the race was on. In just 300 years, warships surged from pentaconters oared by 50 men to these massive double hulled behemoths powered by 4,000. Flash forward another 2,000 years, give or take, the whole thing happens again. So by this point, ships had bigger hulls and all power was by sail. Sailing ships didn't batter very well. The first of these ships had battering rams, but the ships couldn't back up under sail power and the rigging got all tangled, so it was a mess. So they stopped trying to use them as battering rams. Early attempts to mount cannon on the decks of these ships failed, since that much weight up high made these ships tippy and unstable in rough seas. So for this long period, these ships stopped being useful in warfare and they literally were just shuttles, transport vessels. But the invention of closable gun ports, those little hatches on the sides of the ship, the invention of closable gun ports totally changed the rules of engagement because now you could put cannon on these ships and you could move them low down and have them closer to the waterline where their weight actually made the ships more stable. And you could pack in a lot of these cannon along the length of each side of the ship. The problem was these guns were not accurate. And on rolling ships on open seas, they were not effective at all unless you were really close to your opponent. So ships had to line up side by side with another ship in order to fire their broadside. Voila, one-on-one -on -one engagements, duels. And from that point forward, the race was on. Bigger was better. Bigger ships could pack more cannon and bigger cannon, and they could unleash the bigger broadside. So one row of cannon became two, two rows of cannon became three, six pounders gave way to seven pounders, then eight pounders, 22 pounders, 30 pounders, more cannon, bigger cannon, the race was on. And here too, the critical trigger of the arms race was a change in behavior. It was a new technology, that forced battles to be fought at very close range and one-on-one, -on -one. so the nautical equivalent of a tunnel or a branch. And from that point forward, bigger became better, and selection pushed these weapons to the extreme. Well, when you step back to think about it, this same simple prerequisite applies to lots of our history's greatest arms races. So one-on-one -on -one fights, both in battle and in tournaments in particular, sparked explosive evolution of arms and armor in medieval knights. And one-on-one -on -one dogfights among the very, very first military aircraft sparked an arms race in fighter design and in plane speed. So again and again and again, the same prerequisites trigger the arms race. All right, so the first big parallel, and this was the longest one, but the first big parallel is this idea of duels. A certain type of fight, these one-on-one -on -one contests, helps precipitate arms races in both animal and military weapons. Well, it turns out that once an arms race gets triggered or once an arms race starts, 
both military and animal arms races unfold in exactly the same way. So they proceed through this sequence of stages, if you will. And one of those stages is this idea of deterrence. As these weapons get big, they begin to function as signals in addition to being actual implements or tools of battle. Only the best conditioned males, the absolute top of the lot, the individual males with the largest body sizes, the best immune systems, the most stored nutrients and energy reserves, only the best of the best can produce the really, really big weapons. And that means that weapon size becomes a pretty good indicator. I mean, effectively a billboard, if you will, of the fighting ability of each male. So rivals start to use weapon size to decide whether or not to escalate a fight. They don't just lunge into battle, they assess each other beforehand. Whose weapon is bigger? Because weapons are honest signals of the fighting ability of a rival, it often pays the smaller males to simply walk away. So weapons start to act as deterrents, settling these contests without dangerous battle. And in fact, in the species with the biggest weapons of all, the vast majority of their contests get settled this way without the knockdown drag out fight. So one study of caribou, for example, watched more than 11,000 male contests. Only six escalated all the way to full battle. Six out of 11,000. Caribou have the largest weapons relative to their body size of any living vertebrate and more than 99% of their contests get settled without a fight. So this leads to this odd paradox that the species with the biggest weapons are often the most peaceful. I mean, make no mistake, they can and they definitely do fight. But full-on fights tend to be relatively rare. And looked at across the population, the net effect is actually peace. Well, we use our biggest weapons as deterrents too. During the heyday of the British Empire, for example, first-rate ships of the line were absolutely state-of-the-art weapons, and they made splendid deterrents. Simply sailing one of these ships into troubled waters could settle disputes on the spot. The wooden hull of one of these ships required 6,000 oak trees, and these are oak trees that are more than 100 years old apiece. And for European nations that were largely deforested already at this time, that cost was staggering. It was prohibitive. Most nations had none of these warships at all. Britain kept dozens and dozens in her fleet. That period of time was called, incidentally, the Pax Britannica, or the British Peace. Well, the US uses its most expensive ships in exactly the same way today. So a Nimitz class carrier and its associated strike group costs more than $20 billion. The United States has 11 of these carrier strike groups. No other nation has even one. China is the closest. They've sort of cobbled together one strike group, but it's not really there yet. Massive, powerful, prohibitively expensive, these carriers function both as weapons and as deterrents. They're portable projections of military power that we shuttle like chess pieces to stabilize troubled regions and to implement our foreign policy. And I'm telling you that these weapons at their core are no different than these. Extreme weapons are extreme weapons and their biology really is the same. I also have to point out that all of this same logic applies at the level of political landscapes and nation states too. So the Cold War, for example, the most terrifying arms race of all time, was at its core a duel, as the world stage coalesced around two opposing superpowers. And deterrence played a huge part in that arms race too. According to most of the military scholars I've read to date, deterrence may be the main reason that we're still here today. All right, onward. Now to the last and, and perhaps the most fun of these parallels. So you're stuck in an arms race, and weapons are surging forward, evolving to bigger and bigger and bigger sizes, more elaborate, more extravagant, much, much more expensive. Well, we've just seen that this makes these weapons fantastic deterrents. They're essentially billboards 
that honestly advertise the fighting ability of an opponent? Well, they work as deterrents because only the best of the best, the richest nations or the biggest and healthiest bulls and bucks, only the wealthy can afford to pay these exorbitant costs. So what does everybody else do? Supposing you're not the biggest male on the block. You're smaller, you're weaker, life didn't smile on you the way it did them. What do you do if you cannot afford the biggest and the best weapons? The answer is you cheat. And it turns out that cheating is rampant. Once you start to look for it, you find it everywhere. So take dung beetles, for example. I told you I started out spending a bunch of years studying dung beetles. The biggest and the best males, these are the individual males that have the really long horns. These are the beetles that win the fight. They guard the entrances to tunnels containing the females. Well, not all the males in these populations are big. In fact, most of them are pretty tiny. And tiny males don't play by the rules. So for one thing, they ditch the big weapons. Horns are expensive and they're not gonna help you anyway if you're tiny. So these males are completely hornless and they actually look and act an awful lot like females. And it turns out that these small beetles, not only do they not have horns, they use a totally different set of behaviors. They sneak into tunnels on the sly. Instead of trying to fight a losing battle at the entrance, these little guys dig their own tunnel, a side tunnel, that can intercept the guarded tunnel beneath the guarding male. In this way, they can sneak into a tunnel undetected. And when they do, they go straight down to the female. They mate with the female, turn around and leave. They can be in and out of the tunnel in as little as 10 minutes. Well, as you probably know, sneakers like this lurk in all kinds of animal populations. So some of my favorite sneaky small cuttlefish cloak themselves in colors that look like females. And they can sidle right up next to a courting male. They can literally slip in between a male and the female that he's courting. Sneaky male salmon zip into a territory raining sperm down in a big cloud over a female's eggs, in and out of the territory so fast that the guarding male can't stop it. And here on the mountainsides around us in Montana, sneaky bighorn sheep called coursers race into a big bull's territory while he's distracted in a fight. So in species after species after species, males that cannot afford to play by the rules break the rules, and cheat. Well, when you think about it, cheaters affect the whole dynamic of the arms race because what they're doing is they're stealing reproductive success away from the big weaponed males. Those big males still pay the full price of building and using their weapons. But now the payoffs, the benefits that they glean from having those weapons get smaller. Eggs that are fertilized by sneaker males aren't fertilized by the guarding male. He still produces the horns and he still fights all day to guard that tunnel, but the offspring of the tunnel now gets sired by another male. Well, at the population level, as long as these sneaky males steal only a little bit, not much changes. The benefits of these big weapons on average at least stay huge and the arms race surges forward. But when the cheaters start doing too well, they can collapse an arms race. Because suddenly it's not worth it anymore to produce the huge weapons. Males without the big weapons start doing better than the males with the big weapons. And we expect these big weapons to quickly disappear. Well, cheaters erode the success of our biggest weapons too. And they've done it for thousands of years. Asymmetric warfare, guerrilla tactics, these are the classic cheats. If you don't have the resources to face an invading force head on in conventional battle, then don't. Guerrilla tactics are literally exactly like sneaky male fish and beetles. They never wear military uniforms. Instead, they hide, blending in with the civilians in exactly the same way that sneaky beetles or cuttlefish look and act like females. And they strike with quick sneaky lunges, not open, fair, one-on-one -on -one battle. And they use makeshift inexpensive weapons like Molotov cocktails, pipe bombs, and IEDs. So here too, as with animals, as long as these cheaters don't inflict that much damage, nothing changes. State-of-the-art weapons technologies continue to be well worth their price. But when a cheating tactic starts doing too well, 
then overnight they can totally collapse an arms race. And over and over throughout our history, technologies that cheated have collapsed an arms race. Often, these involve a new type of weapon. Always, always, they involve a tactic that's cheap. They win by not paying the price of these big weapons and by rendering those big expensive weapons obsolete. So English longbows and gunpowder together spelled the end for medieval armor. I mean, as soon as plate armor could be pierced, then suddenly it wasn't such a great idea to march into battle sitting astride a horse like a big bulky shining target. And literally overnight, armor went from being a fantastic form of protection to an expensive, heavy, bulky liability. Well, so too, exploding shells shattered the arms race for sailing warships, and submarines caused ironclad battleships to be obsolete. And in every case, and it turns out there are dozens, new strategies that broke the rules of engagement caused our most expensive state-of-the-art weapons to suddenly be obsolete, hugely expensive, and no longer worth the price. Well, as I start to wrap up here, I have to add, I have to flash forward to the present day and sort of leave you with a sobering thought because I'm starting to suspect that we may be dangerously close to exactly this type of a situation right now. So as you all know, the United States stands today alone as the sole superpower. And our weapons are both exorbitantly expensive and magnificent. We can come back and talk about this because China is gaining fast, but at the moment, at least, we're the sole superpower. We have the most advanced weapons technologies in the world, and we're almost certainly safer because of it. Our newest technologies, by the way, have incredible potential both as weapons and as deterrents, exactly like the animal weapons. The Gerald Ford class aircraft carriers, brand new, just $13 billion a piece and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, an aircraft that cost more than $400 billion to design and build. These are awesome examples. But all of these weapons depend critically on software, steering and navigation of our submarines and our aircraft carriers, guidance of our missile systems, the sensor nets that we deploy to detect incoming missiles, command and control, whoa, command and control, safeguards on our nuclear weapons, all of these systems are controlled by computers and software. It turns out that a pilot can't even fly a modern fighter today without this software. Fly-by-wire systems, as they're called, are critical for handling these planes and for making sure that the pilots don't black out from the G-forces. And all of these systems are vulnerable to hackers. I mean, cyber hackers are the ultimate cheat. They're a perfect sneak, surreptitiously worming into our control systems. Honestly, I used to think that the danger of cyber hackers was a stolen credit card number or identity theft. And oh my God, did my worldview change when I started researching all of this. So as you may or may not know, the United States has actually already been hacked several times. In 2004, the Chinese broke into a suite of our state-of-the-art weapons systems in an event called Titan Rain. And in 2013, we caught them at it again. This time, They'd compromised the Terminal High Altitude Missile Defense System, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the F-22 Raptor, our MV-22 Osprey, as well as 37 other systems, including our drones. And the scariest part about all of this, they weren't simply stealing secrets, they were inserting code. They were inserting code into our systems designed to hide there, to lurk undetected. These scripts, had they not been found, would have given the Chinese complete control over our weapon systems. So by activating these hidden programs, they could have turned our most expensive weapons against us, raising, I think, an alarming question of whether our weapons too might soon be obsolete. So like medieval armor and battleships before them, simply no longer worth the price. The silver lining, if you want to call it that, is that the United States military is well aware of this threat to our security. I had a chance to hear General Michael Hayden, former director of both the NSA and the CIA, talk at a conference on cybersecurity in Washington, D.C. in 2016. And he considers cyber hacking to be threat number one to our national security. 
And he considers cyberspace or the internet to be the fourth theater of war. So land, sea, air, and now cyberspace. And he says that they know that the Chinese, the Russians, and the North Koreans, as well as probably the Iranians, have buildings full of hackers literally working 24 seven to break into our systems. So this is the new arms race, since he admits that we have just as many on our side hacking back. And according to him, at least our hackers are better than their hackers, at least for now. Well, as bizarre as this might sound, I got to present at that conference too. And they slatted me right after General Michael Hayden. If you can imagine me standing in front of that crowd talking about animal arms races and sneaky male dung beetles to the chief technical officers of the FBI, the CIA, the Department of Defense, NSA, as well as all these top execs and technical officers from Microsoft, Google, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, talk about a fish out of water. But it actually was a blast. And to show you just how strange and exciting all of this can be, and how far crazy ideas like this can take you, I recently got to witness these state-of-the-art technologies firsthand. So the Navy was kind enough to fly me out to the Carl Vinson CVN-70 as part of their civilian sort of ambassador program. And I got to go out to the head of our carrier strike group one while it was at sea in the Pacific conducting military operations. So that means we had to fly out to the carrier in one of their transport ships and catch the tripwire, which means you go for an arrested landing from 150 miles an hour to zero in like 100 feet. We got to observe the inner workings of this carrier at sea, conducting operations. They let us see everything from the bridge to the bowels of the ship. We got to stand on the flight deck as F-18 Super Hornets and brand new F-35 Strike Fighters come screaming in for landings. I mean, literally slamming onto the deck and yanking to a stop 20 feet from where we stood. This is with my cell phone. <laughs> so you wanna talk about an adrenaline rush. I got to look at these new F-35 fighters firsthand, talk to the pilots that are flying these things. The helmet alone on one of these fighters costs half a million dollars each. And most importantly of all, I got to talk to the crew, from the cooks, to the mechanics, to the people running the nuclear reactors, to the pilots, to the first officer, and the captain. And I asked all of them about the threat of cyber hacking. Guess what? It's threat number one. They worry about this one all the time. A little alarming. So I have to confess as I tie this together, it's been kind of a wild, crazy journey for me. Full confessions, I'm a biologist. I study beetles, not battleships. And I actually confess I used to be nervous about talking and writing and speaking about the parallels with the military. So when I published my book, Animal Weapons, I called it Animal Weapons in the title because I was scared to go all in in the title with the full military implications of these parallels. The book is still about half and half, but I, I was scared to, to call it anything other than Animal Weapons. I'm not scared now. I've talked to admirals and generals, foot soldiers, sailors, historians, and chief technical officers of the Department of Defense, the FBI, the CIA, and NSA. These parallels are real. And at some level, I kind of love the idea that basic muddy boots research can reach so far. I mean, who thought that poking around in a rainforest or in African pastures studying beetles could ever tell us anything about our own weapon systems or about things like national security. I mean, I love that fact. But I also have to say that the more I dug, the more convinced and astonished I became that these parallels that we're talking about really are real. And I know already that these parallels are transforming how I think about biology. So they're causing me to think about my own system in new ways and they're guiding research in directions that we never would have anticipated. And my gut tells me that this crossover is gonna turn out to be just as useful the other way around. So for example, if you follow United States national defense strategy, it's all coalescing around something called great power competition, which sure looks an awful lot like we're setting ourselves up for yet another duel. And I think biology has a lot to tell us about how that kind of a situation might turn out. But for now at least, I hope I've convinced you that there are some exciting and surprising insights to be gleaned from the extraordinary weapons of beetles and crabs and caribou and elk. Thank you.
Now what? Do I have to share host back or you got it? No, we have it, so you don't have to. All right. How, do I have to look at chat questions? Or are you going to read me questions? What happens? I'll stop sharing. I think we've lost Stella's actual voice on Zoom. I'm, I'm coming back. I'm coming oh, back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hang on. She's the moderator. Would you just write down the row and number of your seat? That, that's going to be easier than the pictures. Just write down the row and number of your seat. All right. Let me, um, right. if we can undo the mute. Uh, who's, who can I? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Is that me? Because I'm the host or did I hand the host back? I think uh, Victoria has the host. Victoria's okay. the host. Yeah, uh, I, most done. people should be able to do that. Okay. Uh, I wish I could turn this around so you could see. Maybe I can. Because you just got a huge round of applause and I'd love for you to... Oh. <laughs> I couldn't hear it, so thank you. <laughs> thank you all. In the days of Zoom, it's really hard to uh, gauge everybody's I do feel a little and, bit like I'm talking to the wall, because I am <laughs> down in my basement. <laughs> well, thank you. It uh, looks like you're in uh, Beautiful outdoors without a smoky landscape. All right, let me see if I can get that's, some that's questions. That's because it's a fake background. I'm in a basement. <laughs> Hang tight one second. Let me see. Oh, is this the... Can y'all, can, Doug, can you see people? Um, I can see some people, not necessarily everybody. Should All there right. be a chat? How do I know if there's a so, question? So let me, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to the live room first. Um, any questions? Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell me and then you can, I can repeat it. So the question is, um, in uh, human battles, it goes from a duel to a scramble to a duel to a scramble. And do you notice that patterning in animals? OK, interesting. But it, I wouldn't have said I noticed that in, in humans either, although I do think there are lots of situations where you, know, you end up with something that tends to be more of a scramble. And then something simple will coalesce it around a duel. I, Honestly, the funny thing is I think that in animals, we're not used to asking that question or even looking at it. There's a few papers out there on scrambles and textbooks talk about mating systems and scramble competition. So it's been one of the kinds of mating systems for 40 years. But oddly enough, nobody's paid much attention to watching the fights and figuring out how often the contests really play out as duels and how often they get interrupted or devolve into these more chaotic scrambles. It's sort of a wide open, it's one of these new things that came from the military that's now causing us to ask questions that we wouldn't have asked before. But I do think that there are situations, let me, let me twist that a little bit. It's hard for me to know whether there are lineages of animals that go back and forth or that cycle between scrambling and dueling. But I do want to mention one thing. I do think that the arms race really does follow a cycle. And I only had time to sort of touch on parts of it today. But I do think that once the process gets started, once the stars align and those conditions are met and you sort of launch on this trajectory, the weapons get bigger and bigger and bigger. As they get bigger, they get more expensive. As they get more expensive, fewer and fewer males can afford to pay the price. And eventually you reach a point where that is so egregiously asymmetrical that small guys start cheating. And so the cheaters are all over the place. We, we've known about sneak strategies forever, but we never really thought of them in the context of this cycle of an arms race before. The cheaters invade, and then things can persist for a while, but eventually the cheaters get so good that the race collapses. 
And I think what happens then is if, you, if you're thinking of a lineage of animals, then it doesn't mean they go extinct. It means they get rid of the weapons. Individuals that stop producing the weapons do better. We know that they usually can shut off weapons because a lot of times females don't have weapons to begin with. You, you can turn it on and off already. So animals just ditch the weapons. But now you've got a population of animals that still has the three critical pre-ingredients. They probably got intense male competition and limited resources, and they probably still fight in duels. So the system is still primed. And I think what happens is something else turns into a weapon. Maybe it's a hind leg instead of a foreleg, or maybe it's a horn over here instead of over here. And the whole process launches off again and repeats itself. We never really knew to look for that before. But now when you look across animal populations and lineages, I think we see tons of evidence for that. You, you see that weapons appear and then disappear and appear and disappear and appear and disappear. And we find these lineages like the cervids or the bovids with tons of kinds of weapons and all these different species. And we have a tough time explaining why they're so different from each other. And I think it's just this, this ongoing engine that leads to weapons that has gone in all these crazy directions. So that's not what you asked. I know I had to sidestep whether they transition from scrambles to duels, but what I'm saying instead is we do see evidence in animals that this cyclical process of here's a weapon, it gets huge, it disappears. Here's a new weapon, it gets huge, it disappears. That kind of back and forth cycling, I think we do see. And there's really ample evidence for it in any of these groups of animals that have these crazy weapons. Does that make sense? I think so. Thank you. Sure. Um, and and uh, Robert says thank you too. Let me uh, turn it over to Zoom. Uh, is anybody does anybody have any questions on Zoom? If you raise your hand, I can scroll through. I don't see any hands raised on Zoom. All right, so let me ask everybody. If nobody's asking me questions, do you buy it? Do the parallels feel real, or do you think it's thin ice? We've we've got a lot of nods on this end. Oh. Okay. Okay, we've got another question here. Do you have time for a couple questions? I do, yes. Do, the question is, in drawing parallels, do you think that there are, um, in our, in our uh, conflict with China, do you think that there are weapons in the U.S. arsenal that act as deterrents? Or, or do you see us going into dueling? Okay. So, so first of all, I do think that despite all the, the recent politics focused on Russia, I think when you step back and you look at the real landscape, the biggest, most significant future interacting is going to be China. And there's a lot of studies that suggest that the rate that their economy is growing, they're going to pass us within a decade. They're playing a longer game, so they're sort of following different rules. But there's no question at all that the sort of future of superpower interactions are going to be determined by the US and China. So how that plays out is going to be big. The idea of deterrence the way that I have studied it. So in the context of these really expensive weapons like tusks or antlers or horns or aircraft carriers and F-35 strike fighters, the really expensive weapons, the idea in that situation is that the weapons are really honest indicators of the sort of fighting potential, the gross domestic product, the economy, the, the, the potential of the other individual or other nation as a rival. And, and what's going to happen is these technologies are getting so expensive so fast that, that fewer and fewer nations are going to be sort of in the game. Just like we saw with the Cold War, satellite countries are going to align themselves with, you know, with one of the sides or the other, and you're going to get sort of the allies and the axis or the equivalent of that in our modern stage. Um, so in that sense, these weapons do act as a deterrent, and they play by the rules. And if you think about things like the Cold War, it really was... <laughs> It's so similar to a fight you'd see between elk or between crabs on a beach. I mean, you had the two superpowers with their really deadly nuclear weapons, but they didn't end up deploying the nuclear weapons. 
It's like they weren't the six fights out of 11,000 in the caribou. What happened instead is they started sparring a little bit, which is what deer and elk and all these animals do. You start with lower intensity conflicts. And so during the Cold War, we had all this stuff that went on in Afghanistan. We had Korea, we had Vietnam. These were all proxy wars were proxy because they both sort of ultimately involved the two superpowers in opposition, but they didn't go nuclear. So they were, they were low scale conventional conflicts sort of like test, oh, yep, they're still there. Everybody backs down, everybody saves space and they're out. They don't go nuclear. And so in a sense, what am I trying to say? Th those types of interactions, because it was a duel, made it both prone to escalation, which is bad, but they also made it very predictable, which is good. You can read the signals clearly from the other side and that means you can step back down again from the brink as well as you can step up. The thing that is worth thinking about now is that that worked predictably because only the superpowers had the really expensive weapons. Now, if you look at us versus China, only the superpowers may have the most expensive weapons, but the most expensive weapons aren't the deadly ones. They're the conventional weapons. They're the aircraft carriers and things like that. The nuclear weapons and the biological weapons and the chemical weapons, those, the weapons of mass destruction are actually not that expensive anymore. It's a fundamental difference from the Cold War. The really dangerous stuff actually isn't all that expensive. And there may be a dozen countries now that have nuclear weapons. And so now we're maybe talking about something that is very much like a scramble because lots of nation states have these really dangerous biological or nuclear weapons. And as far as those weapons are concerned, a scramble is a hell of a lot more chaotic and unpredictable. And I guess I feel like that's an even more dangerous situation in a way than something a showdown between the US and China. So. I'm giving you a convoluted answer because it gets complicated. I think politically, if we align it against China and it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's going to escalate fast as a duel. And that's going to cause both countries to start pouring more and more and more resources into it, which is, you know, a thing that may not be advisable for a variety of reasons. But the really scary story is the weapons of mass destruction. And they're actually scary because they're unpredictable, because they're not as expensive anymore, and they're not playing by the same rules that these types of weapons were before. Thank that you. Confused? Does that make sense? Getting a lot of nods. Have me clarify. Okay. Uh, I have a question that's biologically based. Oh, do you have a question? Let me ask this one real quick and then we'll move on to. to uh, we wrote a paper in zoology two years ago. Uh, it might have been written by you. I'm not sure. Um, on the correlation between elk antler size and testicle size, and those that had smaller antlers had larger, more productive testicles. Is this familiar to you? And have you seen this with other species? Yes, I'm not the author of the elk paper, but I am the author of an analogous paper on beetles. Um, oh, we probably read that too. We did a comparison. Of both of them. We, have, we have seen that in a variety of species. And, and again, the idea is that animals have limited resources and it's the same problem nation states had during the Cold War. If you put huge portions of your gross domestic product and all of your discretionary resources into, into the military, you don't have those same resources to then spend on other social services or other aspects of your economy. And animals have the same problem. If they shunt all of their resources into the weapons, then sometimes they don't have enough left over for other things. Now, now one of the inequities in nature is that not all individuals are starting with the same amount of resources. And the animals that are able to produce the real, you know, the Boone and Crockett type bulls and bucks probably have a ton more resources to begin with than the little guys. And so in a sense, they kind of can do it all. They can have really big weapons and still have big testes. But when you look closely, what you find in a lot of these systems is putting all the resources into the weapons can shunt it away or stunt it other structures. And, and one of the ones that, that pays a brutal price is often the, the gonads or the testes size. And that leads to an interesting trade-off. It's like you can't, if you're gonna rely on sperm competition and cheating or sneaking, then you need the testes. If you're gonna rely on guarding harems and the traditional tactics, you need the weapons. You sometimes get sort of specialization of males with the small males having relatively big testes focusing on the sneak strategies and the big males focusing on the antlers. But, um, but you, yes, you often see it, this evidence of this trade-off. I guess what I wanted to say, I made it more confusing. When you really look closely, the biggest animals of all don't really face the trade-off. Life isn't fair, they have it all. It's the intermediate males that are sort of still in the game, that are still producing antlers and trying to play by those rules, 
that don't really have enough to do it all. And so they put the resources into the antlers and then it stunts, it stunts their testes and other structures as a result. Thank you very much. Good answer. I've got a question back here. Um, Perfect. So this is a great question, biologically based. Um, can you explain um, the why females participate? Can you say that again? You said it's like the the female participation in an arms race. And we'll, okay. we'll stop there. That that I think I summarized it right. So can you explain the um, the premise behind the the female engagement in arms race and um, well, so I need a little bit of clarity. I mean, one thing is our fe most of these weapon systems that really cycle out of control are all in males. So one kind of question related to females is what's going on in the few lineages where females do produce the weapons? And I can talk about that. But the other thing is how do females play into the arms races of the weapons that are primarily the male weapons? And they can play into that too. And that's what I think you're asking from, from first, the way it was phrased. First one, you know, first one. He's nodding at the first one. Oh, the first one. Yeah. So why, why do females sometimes have weapons or what's going on there? Yes. Okay. So, so two things. So some of the classic examples where females have weapons, what you find is it's a totally different ecological context. So caribou is a really good example. Caribou have huge weapons in males. And there's no question that the, everything I talked about today is the story for those weapons. That's male-male comp it serves as a tool as a weapon but it also serves as a signal and a deterrent and 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 in that context it's sexual selection for winning in these battles among males that drives the evolution of the big weapons now males face a cost benefit you know thing if they put too much into the weapons then they're stunting their body size or their health or their immune system or their testes there's sort of a trade-off and, and it's sort of the benefits that you get balances the cost that you pay but that balance can get really tipped in these animals because the winning males do so well. They get such high reproductive rates compared to the other males that, that it pays for the males to have a huge weapon. Very often in the same populations, it doesn't pay the females to have huge weapons. They don't get the same kind of spectacular reproductive rewards from having big weapons that the males do. It's a different, it's a different set of costs and benefits. And as we've already talked about with things like testes, there's sometimes a material cost, a price you pay. And in the case of females, that price is going to come at the expense of fecundity. And fecundity is the rate limiting crucial ingredient for determining reproductive success in females. And so they pay a higher price. All else being equal, females are going to pay a steeper price for shunting resources to horns or antlers than the males are. And that simple difference in costs and benefits explains why females almost never benefit by producing the big weapons. In caribou, there's a separate situation in some parts of their range where resources become critically limiting during certain parts of the year. Females end up having to fight with other females, not over males. They're fighting over feeding patches with resources that they need for their calves. So females end up investing a ton in reproduction and in fecundity. And part of that means post-birth care. And part of that means fighting for food resources to keep rival families and females away so that her calves can eat during these critical time periods. And in those places, females produce tiny little antlers. They're nowhere near as big as the male antlers, but the females actually have antlers. But it's a cost benefit thing again. It's a very particular extreme situation where the females benefit by being able to fight rival females to keep them away from food resources that they need for their young. And in that situation, the cost benefit balance tips a little bit towards females having weapons. Not a lot, they're nowhere near as big as the male antlers, but it, enough that they've started producing antlers. So you do get these things. You find some animal lineages where all, everything flips and all the battles and the competition for reproduction happen in females rather than males. You see this in jacanas, you see this in pipefish and seahorses and pycnogonid sea spiders. And so in these types of really special animals, the females are fighting females and all the rules apply to females, but you don't tend to get big weapons for the same reason. Weapons come at the expense of fecundity and that price is just too steep for females. So the Jacanas females have spurs. They're bigger in females than in males, but they're not that big. 
And in some of these other systems, the females are the fighters, but they don't, they never benefit by investing that much in weapons because the price is just too high. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna just see if there's one question on Zoom and then I know a lot of you had just checked the time, it's 5.15 and if some of you need to run, but let me just look at the Zoom list. Um, okay. I think if, if y'all raise your hand. Oh, well, there is a hand raise. Alyssa Hoffman hand raise? has a hand raise. Go ahead and, and unmute yourself and ask. I can't quite scroll down, so. Hi, so I was wondering, because historically humans and animals have like been seen as different but as time goes on like people are discovering that humans and animals have similar things. And now we have a, another biological study where humans and animals are being compared. So do you think that your research will open up more avenues for comparing humans to animals? I do, I mean, I think, I mean, as a biologist, technically humans are animals, but you're right. We tend to, we tend to separate them off and assume that we play by a whole different set of rules. And, and I think that there really is value in stepping back and recognizing situations that are so similar because there, there are lots of parallels with aspects of behavior and mating systems and, and the weapons are just one more example where I think we can, we can look to the diversity of behaviors and other kinds of animals and get a sense of perspective or context that helps us look backwards at ourselves and really think long and hard about why we do and act, why we do some of the things we do and why we act some of the ways that we do. So I teach a whole semester class on animal behavior and we spend quite a bit of time at the end sort of reflecting on the big patterns and the lessons that we've learned from other animals and how they make us think about us differently. And you know, a lot of times what they do is they help us understand sort of intrinsic biases or our tendencies to react to situations in ways that don't make a lot of sense or that might not actually be that helpful to us right now. But when you think of them as sort of a legacy or baggage that we've inherited from our ancestry, it actually helps provide a sense of context and it can point towards ways that we can step in as a society and as a culture to help sort of mitigate things. If we know we're sort of primed to react in a certain way, we can often use everything from the legal and judicial system to reward systems or incentives to try to help improve those contexts and, and help people behave in ways that are better. So behavior is one where there's lots of parallels. I think the military technologies is a really fun one too. I really think that animals have spent millennia solving certain types of challenges and in particular challenges that involve weapon systems and security or attacks or defense. There's a lot of diversity out there. There's a lot of lineages of animals. They're all sort of their own independent experiments figuring out how to solve these problems. Well, we face similar problems today as a species and if we can look to the diversity in animals and see how they solved it, we might come up with some ideas that are really original or different that'll help us sort of, again, examine our own situations and see them more clearly or come up with clever solutions. So the first step, as you pointed out, is recognizing that we're not so fundamentally different from these other animals as we might think. That there are a lot of similarities and a lot of parallels and it gives us a really, a really exciting place to sort of start looking. Thank you very much. That was a great question. I appreciate folks on Zoom reaching out. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna um, I'll let you know, encourage questions to come uh, afterwards, but uh, with respect to the time, uh, if folks need to go, we'll do, uh, can you, which one is, is this the, am I waving my hand in front of you? Yes, you are. Uh, okay, good. So I'm just, now I figured out how to show you the audience. Um, if we want to do another round of applause and say thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully you can. I, hope, I hope it was at least thought provoking. You don't have to agree with me on everything. <laughs> this was by far one of the most fantastic lectures I have attended and I've had a couple of people text in and email in and with their appreciation. So well, thank thanks. you very much for taking the time out of your day to spend it with us here at Montana Tech. Um, if anybody else has a question or two, um, Feel free to, to linger about and we can, you know, chat for a little bit longer. And um, if you have questions or after, you're certainly welcome to send me an email and I can pass them along. So um, yeah, thanks. go hang out for just one second. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Let me look at our, our Zoom link here. Anybody else on Zoom want to get a question in? I don't see any. 
think we're there. <laughs> Hands raised. Oh yeah, let me um, let me hang on to that. Uh, let me just so if you put this the row and the seat number, yeah, yeah. So if you've got stuff to hand in, so. All right. Any other questions, Doug? I'm gonna. Um, seems like everybody's. Can you? Oh, you can't see. Out. Now, Shall right? I go? I can. Oh, I can. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Can you? Can you see me from here? Yes. No, I can't see you. There you go. <laughs> um, I can, until you're masked up, I can't. I, I want to do some space. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Did you have one more question? Yes. Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, so his question is, oops, his question is, um, how did you do the studies on the dinosaurs since they're not uh, the reptilian behavior since dinosaurs are hard to or impossible to study? How might you draw those parallels from fossils? Great question. And paleontologists are a particularly cantankerous group. I have to say, I'm buddies with a bunch of them, so they argue about this stuff all the time. I mean, how, what you can infer is really tricky. We, we have used some of our studies in insects and other animals to try to identify patterns that we see that we think are consistent with the use of these weapons in these types of contexts. So in particular, this idea of deterrence, that these big weapons function as a signal. One of the things that makes something like a weapon a signal is that it tends to be really big it tends to be really conspicuous and visible and obvious. It's not tucked away or hidden. And when you look at the details, if you look across, say, 100 males in a population, what you find, so if, you, if I measured 100 elk and I measured their shoulder height, I'd find some variation. I'd probably find about two-fold difference between the smallest bulls and the biggest bulls. If I measured the length of their jaw, the length of their ears, I'd probably find about a two-fold difference between small and large. But if I measure the antlers, it's more than a 20 fold difference. There's little tiny spikes all the way to these huge racks. So even though legs and ears and height are all traits that you could look at and measure, the antlers are special. They're more variable. They differ more widely from individual to individual than other parts of the body. And if you measure antler size and leg size and you compare them on a graph with body size, you see a special pattern, these big weapons have a steeper slope if you compare antler size to body size than other parts of the bodies of the same animals. So what we've argued is that's pretty special. That tells you that part of the function of that structure is probably as a signal, as a visual signal that's being used either by males or females to assess or size, size up the, the, the size or the fighting ability or the quality of that individual. So what we tried to do is go to dinosaurs and say, okay, We've got horns like triceratops, we've got frills, we've got lots of kind of crests on that. You know, there's lots of things in these dinosaurs that sure look an awful lot like signals and like weapons that are used in this context. How do you know? So the idea is in principle, you could measure legs and compare leg size with body size. And then you could look at the horns or the frills and compare those with body size. And if they're functioning as a signal in this context of male competition, then probably the, the horn steepness should be steeper than the leg steepness. So we published a paper a year and a half ago, all excited, thinking this is how we can do it. This is how we can go to dinosaurs and infer whether they're likely to have functioned, these weapons are likely to function in the same context. All the heavy hitters got really mad at us. They don't agree with us. They think we're full of it. And the truth is there aren't very many types of assemblages of fossils where you have a very large sample size. And the other problem is like a triceratops falls apart. So if you find a bone bed, how do you know that a head came from the same animal as a leg? So it sounded really easy and we got all excited, but in practice, actually collecting the kind of data you would use is tricky. So, so people have thought long and hard about dinosaurs, but honestly, without any behavior directly, the best we can do is make intelligent guesses. What I can tell you is that the variation that we see looks very similar to the patterns that we see in living species. So I'm quite comfortable making an educated guess, but that's all it is.
Does that Thank make you sense? very much. That, I think it's, a great, it's a great question and it's a really exciting area in paleontology. There's a lot of paleontologists really working on this now. So it's a great question. Well, and um, my battery light is flashing at me, so I'd hate to leave you uh, with- I can go, that off. was a good but question. It was, right. uh, thank you, that was, uh, did you, do you? I'm getting nods, so yeah, very, very happy with that. It is very difficult. Okay. Um, hang on one second. I'll if if not, that student, hey Stella, if that student is really interested in this and they're willing to email me, I'll send him the paper I'm talking about because then we sort of explain it all and he can decide if he likes it or not. But at least he'll have the paper. Chance, you want to email me and we'll get you the. He doesn't have to. It's okay. It's just if it's something they're really hot on, there's I can give more information. That's all. I'd be interested in it. It's okay. So. Well, thank you very much. This was. Um, uh, as everybody's sort of vacating. Um, for those of y'all who are on Zoom, I believe there's just a few participants. You're welcome to stay or not. Um, Doug, I've been running this uh, speaker series for 10 years, and you were my last speaker, and it was fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm handing your last? The torch. Are you stepping you down are, your side? You are. I'm handing the torch to someone else um, oh. between COVID and sabbatical. It's someone else's turn, and I um, am absolutely on cloud nine. You've just made it uh, oh, thank you so much. wonderful. It was, I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I had, my phone was blowing up. My email was blowing up. The chair oh, of our cool. department said, this is the best talk I've been to at Tech. And, you know, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, abs absolutely. Well, one of these days we will meet in person over a beer and talk some. I would love that. So. I would absolutely love that. So, well, I hope that um, you have evaded the migraine. And, uh, I, I did. I made it. I made yes. it. I made it. So thank you. Yeah. So, you're welcome. Um, okay. I I'm hope our paths cross soon. And I'm looking at you like this, but I think I'm over here. So who knows? Yeah, I'm looking at your side. It's okay. Yeah. It's the reality of Zoom. Take care, stay healthy, and again, let's stay in touch. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Stella, did you have a number for in-house? Uh, I took pictures. I'll count them. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll take pictures. We'll go through. We'll count them. And yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Stay in late and all your help today. Oh, no worries. You have a great one. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye.